Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! This is All Out Politics. We're live in Sunderland. And Sunderland is known to some as Brexit City these days. This is the place that gave Leave its first big win in, on referendum night, the first tremor in that political earthquake. And uh, people are going to be arguing about the consequences for a long time. This morning, we've heard from a former Conservative Party chairman, Chris Patton, Lord Patton, and a leading Brexiteer, Jacob Rees-Mogg MP. One of the best examples of a problem which is completely unresolved. The Irish border question can be solved without having a hard physical border. And there is already a border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. There are different VAT re regimes, custom um, excise regimes on alcohol and cigarettes and so on, and immigration laws. So there is a border already, but it doesn't need to be policed at the border. It can be done remotely. And so there's a very straightforward solution, but it's being used by people who don't want us to leave in the first place to try and keep us in the European Union. One of the best examples of a problem which is completely unresolved uh, is the Northern Ireland border. Mrs May said before the last referendum, uh, and she was absolutely right, um, that you can't uh, be outside a customs union, you can't be outside a free movement uh, area uh, at, without having a border, and that's what we're finding we're facing now. So there's an obvious answer to it, which is to stay in the customs union. Um, words seem to have lost their power, Chris Patton, Lord Patton, in the context of... I mean, you're speaking specifically today about the Irish border, and, and um, from where I'm sitting, people have been talking pretty close to gibberish, and most of them are from your party. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, look, um, the, just before the referendum, uh, Mrs May, then, of course, Home Secretary, said you, you couldn't have um, Northern Ireland in a separate regulatory environment to the Republic. You couldn't have uh, Northern Ireland and Britain outside free movement of people and not have a border. Mm. And that's still true. Um, and we're spending a lot of time trying to um, engage in what is called blue skies thinking, to find some alternative to a border to distinguish between Northern Ireland and the Republic. Um, we've promised that we won't have a hard border. Everybody accepts that a hard border would be extremely bad for the Good Friday Agreement, which was a real achievement of Tony Blair and John Major and Bertie Ahern bringing peace after all those years in, of, of turbulence, of bloodshed in Northern Ireland. Um, and I'm really keen uh, that we should actually fess up and recognise that the best sort of partnership to have between Republic and Northern Ireland is the customs union. David Davis, after the last round of negotiations, said, I want the closest economic partnership so that we don't have to bother about the border. Well, we've got it already. Now, D David Davis also said that we'd be in Germany on the day after the referendum result negotiating a one-on-one -on -one trade deal um, in apparent <laughs> ignorance completely. So you chuckle, and, and I, I know, chuckle I know. Riley as well. I know, well, this you know, I was... fetishization of ignorance I was, is on an I industrial was, scale I, I, I said in my speech this morning that the, one of the problems is that um, <clears throat> these people who go on banging on about trade deals. The closest they've come to a trade deal is the checkout at, at Waitrose. I mean, you know, um, Liam Fox was, was saying that the, the moment we leave, we'll have 40 trade deals to sign. Yes. This is complete gibberish. Uh, 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 well, you mentioned David Davis. Let's have a listen to what he said about the Irish border in April of 2016. I don't believe arrangements need to change. I think the... the That's land... clearly not David Davis, unless things have gone really surreal. I know that we're quite far down. It's my fault. So play, play the third. <laughs> Clip three. We want to have a, a, effectively an invisible border between the north and the south. Now, there are technical ways of doing that. Number plate recognition on, on vehicles, uh, tagging uh, of containers, um, the trusted trader schemes. Uh, quite a lot of very technical stuff, mm -hmm. which has to be... We have to start on it now, so when we get to the end, uh, we'll be in a position to actually implement it. And just fast-forward two years to um, uh, last Sunday, in fact. 
you know, we, we, will, we will do, as we do now, when, when we deal with smuggling across the, the Northern Ireland Republic of Ireland border, it's dealt with by intelligence-led policing, intelligence-led customs investigations. It happens now, uh, and but that's what will happen in the future. We've got a whole lot of new technology now. I mean, uh, we've also had uh, one European Parliament report, we don't agree with it entirely, but one European Parliament report saying technology can help here. We've got a lot of techniques used elsewhere in the world. The so-called, or I don't want to get into, again, into too much technical detail, but the authorised economic operator, where you actually say to a company, you will report back, your accounts will be audited, your warehouses may be audited, but you will report, you will electronically pre-notify. These sorts of techniques are used mm. everywhere in the world, indeed including here, when bringing things in from outside the customs union. So there are ways okay. of dealing with this. What, what, what is going on here? Because, as you say, that is complete gibberish. And, and there might be a journalistic question about why he's not picked up on it more, but the BBC is the BBC. Uh, just as, as a Tory grandee, which you clearly are, what's going on, Chris Patton? Because here you have the Secretary of State for leaving the European Union on national television talking almost undiluted hogwash. Yeah, that's absolutely true, because... Um I wouldn't, say, of course, say hogwash, because I'm... Uh, cool, um, yes, I would. Um, <laughs> uh, it, 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 it is nonsense. There is no virtual border anywhere in the world. If you have different customs arrangements, if you have different tariffs, if you have different systems, systems of regulation, you have a border. That happens everywhere. People say, well, what about Sweden and Norway? There is a border between Sweden and Norway. The Swedish trade minister was here the other day saying it was easier to walk on the moon than to export yes. uh, uh, things into into Norway. But it won't get the reporting, it won't get anywhere near as much coverage as, as Jacob Rees-Mogg standing up today and telling everyone the unicorns are still on the way. Yes, I know, that's, that, that's exactly true. Um, and that is a problem that we actually face because if you make the sort of remarks I've made about um, about uh, the nonsense that's talked on the trade deals which are waiting us out there if only we get out of the customs union uh, if you point out the nonsense which is which is talked about about being able to have virtual borders and um, if you if you take to pieces the arguments that we're somehow going to take back control um, if we're outside the European Union, you're denounced by one or two of our tabloid newspapers and one or two others as being unpatriotic, as being a traitor, as being an enemy of the people. It's all awful hogwash, and it's going to make us at the end of the day. I mean, you know, we, there won't be plagues of locusts. Um, the sun will still come up in the mornings. Mm. Uh, but at the end of the day, we will be... Um, less well off and less influential as a country and I think young people know that very well. I, I don't, you can start the countdown now to people claiming that the sun coming up in the morning is proof that it was the right thing to do to leave the European Union. The, the expectations are being diminished daily aren't they? Well we haven't actually sunk seems to be. Yeah they're, what, they're now, what they're now doing I mean the, the Brexiteers having recognised that um, people wouldn't go along with the idea of a hard Brexit with an over the cliff onto the rocks Brexit um, they're now prepared to settle for anything. So it's not a question of no deal is better than um, uh, a bad deal. The question is a bad deal is better than is better than still having the possibility with no deal of being inside the European Union. So they're prepared to they're prepared to put lipstick on a pig if it's necessary. You um I, I, I make this point because it possibly gives you a perspective that some people listening and, and myself don't have. These people are your former colleagues and friends. So, I mean, there's no partisanship involved in, in your I think some position. of them, they're certainly my former parliamentary colleagues, whether the, all of them are my friends. No, not all of them, but, but look, what, look, what I mean is you're I'll, describing I'll you, a psychological rather yeah, than a political problem. I'll tell you a problem. secret about on, one of them. Go on, then. Um, Jacob rees I've known since he was about eight. Right. I played cricket with him when he was, I think, wearing a waistcoat when he was about, when he was about eight. I Quite know his right. mum and dad, they were very kind to me, didn't agree with them. Um, Jacob had the same views when he was eight and one regarded him as rather a charming, eccentric little boy that he has when he's 48. Now, most of us, most of us grow up along, along the way. And what's happened, he's a perfectly intelligent fellow, though I think he's been pretty mendacious about civil servants and others. Um, but he's, he's allowed the image of himself to take him over. Um, he must be more intelligent than he seems. To talk today about people who want to argue the case um, for a better relationship with the European Union, for not leaving the Uni Uni European Union, to talk about us uh, 
as though we were um, uh, the, the Japanese left behind on atolls and islands in the South Pacific and we don't know that the war's over. Uh, he should be keener about trying to explain to Japanese business why they should continue to invest in the United Kingdom after we've left the European Union. And yet you know he's been taking advice from Steve Bannon, so perhaps there's no mystery at all as to why he's now going down a sort that, of... That may, that may be true. I mean, <clears throat> they take their... They take as their guru um, the, the make um, uh, America great um, uh, ideologues. Um, President Trump was going to be their their best friend. They were going to do all sorts of trade deals, trade deals with President with President Trump. Uh, and what is true about them is that they is that they've confused patriotism and jingoism. The, these are jingoist protectionists, as we've seen with this ridiculous row about where the passport is printed. A ridiculous row, which um, even Keir Starmer has kind of applied to this. Yeah, despite gallery. the fact I think the the Sun was very sensible on the subject. Really? Um, I think I, I think I'm right in saying that, unless <laughs> unless I've been misled. Certainly, the Sunday Times, which is normally mm. um, very. Uh, um, uh, uh, pro-Brexit. The Sunday Times pointed out that there is a difference between being a free trader and being a protectionist. There's also 40 other countries that have their passports printed by De La Rue, so to, to put out the notion that countries should only print passports within their own territories is to put De La Rue out of business by tea time. It, exactly. It actually puts on its website that it publishes <laughs> passports and Strange does currency for the world. Stay with us a little longer. I'm going to take so. a little break and, and Lord Patton will be with us until noon. Joined by Lord Patton for, for another ten minutes or so as he um, uh, recovers from delivering his speech earlier today, one year on from Article 50, where next for Britain. Um, I, 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 I've sort of uh, been quite heavily involved in the, in the Brexit debate, largely un, unintentionally, just because of these silly clips that end up going viral on the internet. When, but, but all I do is do what you've done today. I just, I just lay out some facts, or sometimes as I'll do it now to, um, to Theresa Villiers, who was the Northern Ireland Secretary, I think, at the time of the referendum. Here's, here's Theresa Villiers before the referendum describing the Irish border. I don't believe arrangements need to change. I think the, the land border we share with Ireland can be as free-flowing after a Brexit vote as it is today. You know, special status for Irish citizen and a common travel area allowing free movement for Irish citizens predates our membership of the EU by decades. And there's no reason why it can't continue in the same way after we leave the EU. Now, she's not seeking to mislead voters. She's just profoundly ignorant of reality. Well, she was Secretary of State for, for Northern, Northern Ireland. For heaven's sake. Yes. Um, and she said that anybody who, who suggested that there'd be a problem with the Northern Ireland border was scaremongering. Um, uh, several of, of those who were... Uh, who've said much the same thing in the past, have subsequently said, well, you know, maybe we can change the Good Friday Agreement a bit. The Good Friday Agreement wasn't, wasn't um, uh, perfect. What they're actually trying to say is that um, uh, it doesn't matter if we undermine the Good Friday Agreement by um, having a border because, um, you know, it's only the Irish, it's only Northern Ireland and the Republic. They actually forget the amount of collateral damage which has been done to Ireland, the island of Ireland yes. over the years, by that sort of English-British attitude. I mean, I'm a, I'm a great-grandson of potato famine Irish immigrants. Um, there are, I think, five or six million people in this country, in England and, and Scotland, who's gr who had at least one grandparent who was, who was Irish. Um, we've made a terrible mess of sharing these islands together for 150 years and it would be a tragedy if we undermined that now. There is, and, and I hesitate to ask this question because I, I thought that 20 months after the vote then everything would have calmed down. People like you and, and to a lesser extent me would have sort of thought, oh well, you know, uh, that okay. ship has sailed and now I know what's going to happen. I can calm down and get on with it. But they still don't seem to have a... They keep shouting, get on with it. They still don't have a clue what it is. No, it's perfectly true. I mean, I think what has surprised even me is they haven't got the faintest idea what they want at the end of the road. Um, and they will now, having said... Um, a, a hard Brexit, um, better than um, uh, b b b is, is the best way forward. If we can't get a, bre a, a Brexit deal, it doesn't really matter. They're now desperate for anything, whatever it is, which gets us out of the European Union. Um, but they still won't say what the end destination is. They talk about Canada Plus, um, which would leave us a lot 
uh, less well off when you look at what Canada's relationship economically is with the European Union. Um, but this is the astonishing thing. I, I, I wonder if in your career you've ever seen anything like it. Because we, we've all encountered vaguely cultist tendencies within our own parties and others. We've all encountered a, uh, possibly a desire to believe something trumping the evidence for believing it. But, the, but I, mean, I could sit here, you could sit here for, for uninterrupted for 12 hours highlighting demonstrable <laughs> untruths or deceptions or simple misunderstandings. Or self-delusion. Uh, or self-delusion. And so it continues. Can you, have you seen anything like this in your no, own, long think, and varied career? I think this is definitely the worst thing politically that's happened in my, in my lifetime, not least because of, of the way it's divided the country, not least because um, of the way it's whipped up a not very helpful populism, um, not least because it's not going to mean that um, the lights are turned off um, when we leave. It's not going to mean um, that it's the end of life as we know it, but we are going to be poorer and less influential as a country. And we'll have less money to spend on the things that people really care about, like the National Health Service, like our education, like policing, um, like our armed forces, all, all the things which actually feature most prominently uh, in, on people's political agenda. We will be less poor to sustain them, and we won't have dealt with the really big underlying problems problems in our country, like the low productivity, like the, the way of finding a long-term uh, system for funding the care of the elderly. Those, those problems are simply, simply pushed aside while we get on with this self-harm enterprise. You, um, you sit in the Lords, obviously, you're still an active politician, but I, I'm, I'm interested in what motivates you to put your head above the parapet on, on, on these issues, both as much as you do in Parliament and outside Parliament, speaking, of course. Um, earlier today uh, under the banner of Open Britain. I mean, because you, you very much fit into the category of those described as unpatriotic by the likes of the Daily Mail, and yet I can't really see... My wife says that any day you're attacked in the Daily Mail is a day you haven't wasted. Um, Sounds good. Which I, which I rather <laughs> agree with. That's, that's just in order to, to produce another enemies of the people headline some, sometime or other. No, it's, it's just crazy. It's, it's the, um, look, I, I would defend freedom of the press, freedom of speech every moment of the day and have done, but you have to put up, up with some um, pretty noxious examples of, of that. It's just, it's just the price you pay. But w w what motivates me is how concerned my kids are, and I'm Chancellor of a university, I'm Chancellor of a great university. What we're doing um, is threatening to damage our universities, which is one of the best things we do in this country, despite the fact that they're underfunded in comparison with others, um, in terms of government expenditure anyway. Um, so uh, I'm passionate about that and passionate, therefore, um, about trying to minimise the harm or, or prevent the harm altogether of, of leaving the European Union. What's your fondest hope, or perhaps your most naive dream? Well, um, I, I suspect that um, at the moment, uh, we have to focus on trying to stay in the customs union, trying to stay, if we can, in the single market. Whether we can actually stay in the European Union, as some people um, uh, still suggest we should, um, I think is a much bigger issue. I hope, I, I would hope that we could, but at the very least, the customs union and the single market will make us more prosperous than we would otherwise have been, like Norway, for example, which is a great independent democratic country, um, but it's part of the Euro what's called the European economic area with single market without the customs union but you add that in as well and you've got not not a bad deal but it still wouldn't wouldn't make up for being a member of the european union and um, take back control we're going to lose control and um i hesitate to ask you what the worst case scenario is so i won't i shall ask you instead what your thoughts are about the diplomatic response to the poisoning of, of sergei skripal in, in Salisbury. well i th i think it's it's been to be frank uh, Mrs. May at her best. Mm. I think President uh, Putin is one of, I've met him a few times, I think he's one of the worst people I've ever met. Um, I think he is responsible for doing a huge amount of damage and certainly um, his security services and a combination of them and, and the sort of Russian mafia are certainly responsible for people being killed around the world if they've disagreed with, with uh, the Kremlin's line. Um, I would hope um, that without uh, um, making too much of a song and dance about it, we'd look much more um, beadily at uh, 
Russian money in London, at Russian money and property in London, uh, and the extent to which London has been used, been used as that very good uh, TV series McMafia <laughs> was suggesting earlier, um, as um, a way of laundering um, money um, which has been made either illegally or in pretty suspect ways. So I think we could we could do more, which might be slightly um, below the radar screen, but I think it would be uh, the best way of, of uh, reminding Mr Putin that not, we're not just going to lie down as people like Nigel Farage would have, would have wanted us to um, and take whatever Mr Putin dishes out. And um, I, I suppose finally, I, you're, you're suggesting that hitting him in the pocket would hurt more than this diplomatic response. Perhaps. Yeah, one, one thing that we've never really done uh, is to reveal how much he's worth. Uh, well, um, no. but, but as for those all around him, um, we know that um, uh, how much of it is, is the, res the result of either mafia-like activities or corruption in the Russian government, and, and we shouldn't be a channel for that sort of money. Um, it, um, uh, it's a very good way of, of, uh, uh, of holding a line against Mr Putin, who doesn't want democracy in the West to work, um, because he thinks it's a threat, ultimately, to his own control in Russia. Lord Patton, many thanks indeed. It's been a pleasure. A lot of love coming for you on Twitter as well, Chris Patton. I, uh, people, uh, people want to know why you aren't on there yourself. On Twitter, yes. So I got you just mid gulp there. Wow, you know, wow. Sense. No, I don't. I don't. I don't tweet. <laughs> um, I think my kids would, wouldn't forgive me. No, if that I is probably tweeting. true. It's worse than dancing. A dose of stark reality with Chris Patton on LBC. That's that's a nice summation of the feelings coming in from social media. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It's twelve noon. I do miss